Moving on to agenda item number four, a briefing and discussion on the Trash in Creek study by uh, city staff. For, for the record, this was, this was considered dessert, so uh, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it, was the, it was the carrot to keep everybody here at this meeting. So uh, thank you for sticking around and I uh, appreciate it. We've been looking forward to and discussing this at various meetings over the last several months, so we're excited. Do we get free samples of trash no, I mean, uh, uh, as that's, part of the that's, presentation? You're going to have to listen to find out. Uh, I, to keep you said this was dessert, so I assumed we got... Be, be consuming it at some level? Yeah. Let's see, could you use the other slide presentation, the one that was provided with backup? Those are just extras in case there was questions. Excellent. Thank you. That's the one. Fantastic. Okay, dessert. I, I can absolutely tell you that's the first time I've been called dessert. But I'm not offended. Um, so, uh, Trash Creeks. My name is Andrew Klaman. I'm with Watershed Protection Department. We're in a group called Applied Watershed Research. Um, you may have uh, heard of our most recent hits, blue-green algae, cyanobacteria, EII, PAHs. Um, we do all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, we're out in the field a lot, and uh, we get tasked with many of, of the hard questions that require um, some projects to, to answer them. I'm accompanied today by uh, a couple of my favorite colleagues, Layla Goslink uh, on the left. She's, we pulled her out of retirement because she's got some outstanding research skills. Um, in the middle, uh, John Beachy, uh, he is kind of my model of good decision guy. So if, 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 if I channel my inner, my inner John Beachy, I make a good decision. And then uh, Jeremy Walker, who is an outstanding, outstanding hardened field worker with us. He walked more miles of this and did more of the uh, more difficult uh, creeks uh, than, than, even, than I did, and I, I greatly appreciate his help. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, the reason why we're here today even talking about this, although trash has been uh, something we've been talking about for years and years and years, the problem's not going away. Uh, back in 2020, council uh, uh, gave us CIUR 20, uh, 2234, and it had a lot of requests in it from staff, and staff has uh, fairly quickly within the, next, uh, within the following month or two, gave them mostly everything they needed. Uh, two of the things that they wanted, though, was basically an in-depth uh, explanation or a map or, or a project that told us where is the problem, how bad is the problem, what do we do about this problem, and also a, an explanation of what are other people doing about this problem, uh, so a benchmark study to compare what we're doing, are there any things we're not doing that we should be thinking about doing, are, are other uh, cities doing something that we shouldn't do because it doesn't work or should do? Next slide, please. Um, so whenever I get uh, tasked with something, I always use that the scientific method, and that's pretty easy in a pollutant uh, case. If you're looking for a source of E. coli or a nutrient or something like that, you identify what the source is, a, a good location for that source, then you go upstream and you go downstream, and the delta between upstream and downstream gives you the contribution of that source. You cannot do that with trash. Uh, we actually tried a little pilot studies. The reason why it's taken us two years to come back with this is we've tried pilot studies that have, have flopped until we, this, we kind of hit it on the head, this last one. Um, the reason why it doesn't work so well is two primary reasons. One is the variability in storm intensities. Uh, Central Austin is that flash flood alley kind of thing, and it's really horrible. We also have these little events, and the little rain events might move trash to the creek and make it look worse right there. A medium event might kind of push it around a little bit, and a large event would push it all the way to Ladybird, or maybe get it stuck somewhere where it can't uh, go further. So that uh, variability in storm intensity really changes the dynamic of things flowing through the system. The other thing is the uh, variability in stream uh, character. They call it the, uh, the Manning's N or the roughness coefficient. Um, if your stream is like Little Walnut or maybe uh, parts of Barton Creek, it's just rock. And when you have a storm, everything just flows down and you don't see much trash in the creek. Uh, other creeks have lots of um, bushes and trees and rocks and, and things. That we call them strainer if you're, if you're a kayaker. And they tend to slow things down and grab a hold of these things. So these two things just uh, together make it impossible for you to do an upstream downstream assessment. Next slide, please. So uh, and in, 
instead of just doing a simple uh, study where I could go to 10 or 15 sites, go upstream and downstream, we had to do an extremely labor-intensive one. We tried doing it on East Bolden and, and realized that East Bolden, just within East Bolden, there's so much variability about what we see and what's out there. We, we had to do uh, all the council districts, all the, the north, the south, the east, the west, the, the, the watersheds that are mostly preserved, the watersheds that are mostly impervious cover. Uh, so we chose 20 creeks, uh, that's about half of our major watersheds, and 110 miles, which is a little over half of our uh, main stems of our creeks. Uh, if you wanted to do all the creeks in, in all of Austin, the big main stems in the ETJ, you'd be looking at 500 miles, which is, which is quite a bit. Uh, 100 miles is daunting enough. Um, we took observations every 30 feet because really every 10 feet or so, things can change from being just completely full of trash to nothing. And we took uh, a total of 19,467 data points, which is exciting to me because as a science nerd, whenever you have a very large N, a very large uh, data uh, pool to choose from, you can get some really good power on your statistical uh, correlations. You can get some very tight correlations. Um, there's a lot of anomalies uh, in, in, in data oftentimes. If you have a big enough uh, data set, it just washes all those problems away, pun intended. Um, the, uh, the creek, when, I, when I, I took this literally from council and said, I'm gonna look for trash in creeks, and I'm gonna start at the, the lower bank, the lower bank of what we call the active channel, where most of that water is, and I'm gonna walk the creek and look for uh, trash. I didn't find much. The trash is typically not in what most people consider the creek, the stream bed. It's usually right on the banks where you start getting the vegetation, and a lot of it is up in that early floodplain, that first floodplain bench, before you get to the 100-year floodplain. So we, uh, we defined our area, we chose our, our, our section, and now I can use this to extrapolate all over the city for, uh, for data purposes. Next slide, please. So uh, another benefit is just eyes in the creeks. Um, I've been doing this job for 18 years now, and I kind of thought I saw it all. I've been going to the same sites for almost two decades, and I didn't, I, I've seen trash. I didn't think I was going to uh, be uh, surprised in anything, but I had my eyelids blown off at some of the things that I saw. But just walking these creeks, it made me realize that our team and our, much of our, we need to get out in these creeks and walk these areas that don't get seen very much because there's a lot of hidden stuff out there. Um, Council had also, at the same time, had, had concerns about s scooters and creeks. This is back in 2020 when there was a lot more scooter permitted out there. You'll, you'll, if you remember, there was just scooters everywhere. And they've reduced the total numbers now, so it's not as big a deal. But uh, once they get in the creek, they're probably not going to get out unless someone gets them out. Uh, so we decided to get a handle on that, too, and just every time we uh, were at an observation point, we can click and see if there's a scooter there. Since that, oh, we only found 21. 21 scooters for 110 miles really isn't that bad. You can see they're mostly clustered in the downtown areas right where you expect them to be. But since that time, uh, ATD has worked with uh, 311 and in their little app, and if you don't have the 311 app, if anybody listening does not have the 311 app, please download the 311 app. It's awesome. You can report all kinds of things. We depend on our citizens to be the eyes and ears out there. But uh, you can click down and find uh, scooters on there and you can take a picture and take a location and send, hey, here's a scooter. ATD will then, in short order, call the vendor, and the vendor has 24 hours to go get it, and they do it. It's pretty impressive. So those 21, with the exception of one or two we, we need to go back and check on, have pretty much all been taken out. Um, I personally saw one uh, the other day, and I took a picture of it, and ATD went and got it themselves because the vendor was no longer there. ATD takes it really seriously. So I don't think the scooters in the creeks is as much a problem as people feared it was two years ago. Uh, I think we've got a good handle on that. Next slide, please. So this is a form we carried with us. Um, as you can see, it's basically volume-based. So there's four categories where it's not so bad, it's, it's kind of ugly, it's pretty bad, and then it's horrendous. Um, the scale is not linear. It starts off in, in small quantities and it gets very rapidly up to large quantities, which uh, hampered the statistical analysis a little bit, but I had my stats guy run it both ways, linear and nonlinear, and you came up with the same answer. So uh, we feel like the, uh, the form itself we had different sources. If we saw an obvious source, if we saw an encampment that definitely had trash right there and it's getting to the creek, if we saw an overflowing dumpster, or if we saw an area where someone had taken a parking lot and used a leaf blower to get the leaves off but also blew off all the trash into the creek, we call that property management, we, we were able to identify all these sources. Now, there was, we were not allowed to speculate of, oh, I think it got here. It had to be very obvious and compelling. So um, we were able to then take those 19,467 data points and correlate them 
with their location. And uh, anyway, I, I was really excited about this. And I really thought, hey, I'm going to have a pie chart and I'm going to be able to point fingers at people and I'm going to give you answers and everybody's going to understand this and everything's going to be great. Spoiler alert, it didn't work. Next slide, please. So um, takeaway number one here. Um, I sincerely thought that when we come to these sources and we have all these 19,467 data points with all these varying intensities, that I would be able to say, here's your number one problem, here's your number two problem, let's focus on this one. If we can do this one, we got it. Really, I found a lot of similarity, whether it's an overflowing dumpster, whether it's property management, whether it's um, uh, an illegal dumping where someone just backs up a pickup and tosses out a couple of bags of trash, whether it's the eagle eagle dumping where someone's in their yard and they just kind of throw it over their back of their fence if they're a riparian or owner, or if it's a historic dump, maybe there was uh, someone buried a bunch of stuff and the creek since has kind of eroded it out and it's starting to fall out. All these different sources, take a look at them, they're all basically the same. The median's about the same, the range is about the same. Uh, the highest median range is, um, I can't even read it from here, the, the gray one, what is that? Dumping? Thank you. Dumping unknown. So that's the kind where um, people back up their truck or you just see a whole bunch of garbage dumped at a, at a, at a uh, bridge. Um, the lowest one was outfall or tributary. I thought for sure when you have a tributary come in, it's going to be dumping a lot of trash, conveying it from upstream to downstream. That was actually the lowest. Take a look at encampment. You'll notice on that pie chart, that pie chart is by occurrence, not by intensity. So the most commonly encountered obvious salient source of trash was uh, encampment. And that's kind of a no-brainer, that's kind of biased because that's where the encampments are. Uh, a lot of the dumpsters and a lot of these other things you see, you, you may not be able to see them as much because they're up in the, tucked in the landscape. But uh, I do want to make sure that people know that encampment is a source and it is a, a very salient and very obvious and very compelling source. It just doesn't necessarily the most intense and it's very similar to the other sources. So uh, this chart told me that I cannot single out any one particular thing that we need to address. Next slide, please. The coolest part, I think, about this is that we have these 19,467 data points, and they're all associated with a, um, a method that is both um, reproducible and standardized. So I have a, now I have a frame of reference. Now I have a, 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 a place in time that if we wanted to, five years, 10 years, 20 years, go back and reproduce a portion of this, let's say we do 10%, we can have a very good handle on are things getting better or are things getting worse. One of the concerns that council had was things are getting worse, things are getting worse. And I believe it. We're getting more population, more people, things get worse. That's just kind of the nature of, of the beast. But we couldn't say it definitively was it or or, or not. So now I think we can in the future. Uh, the another neat thing is look at this, uh, the two photos here on the left is Upper Shoal Creek. You'll notice the hot spots, the red ones, are at areas of high intensity. And I'm correlating these just kind of visually with uh, sources. Um, encampment, which a lot of people uh, like to, to point the finger at, and that was one of council's issues back at that time in 2010. There's only one there, and it's up at the top, and yes, it's associated with high intensity. But take a look at all the high intensity uh, points downstream too. None of those have encampments associated with them. Most of those in Upper Shoal Creek are going to be um, property management. A lot of those uh, apartment complexes, um, parking lots and whatnot, the leaf blowers, it's, it's a big problem. And then of course, uh, dumping is a big one. To, uh, a dumpster is overflowing. A lot of these don't have the secondary containment and the dumpsters are right up against the creek. Um, we do have this available for anyone to see. Uh, there's a website on there. We'll probably make this a little more sophisticated uh, when, we, when we roll it out a little more to the public. But uh, anyone can zoom in and out, and we've given this layer to uh, folks like KAB and our other partners who, who manage cleanups. And hopefully we can get a little more uh, strategic about our locations we do cleanups. Next slide, please. I was advised by smart people not to show this slide. It's a mess. But that's kind of what I wanted you to understand about this, is that the, the takeaway here is that Trash intensity, it's not proportional to, to, to its drainage area. It doesn't get worse as you go downstream. You'd assume trash washes downstream, and it, and it does, but it doesn't manifest itself in more and more and more as you go. Uh, some watersheds actually increase in trash as you go straight downstream. Some watersheds decrease in trash as you go downstream. Some watersheds, it doesn't matter where you are in the watershed, the trash is variable all the way throughout it. So it really has to do with that stream roughness. Um, I didn't have to worry about variability of storms in this case because we did this from uh, November to April. And we didn't have any major storms. So I was able to hold that variable uh, still, which is uh, beneficial because then I didn't have to disclaim and, and, and worry about upstream to downstream. Next slide, please. 
Geospatial analysis. Uh, we have some wonderful minds in our group uh, that do GIS work for us. Um, and we wrestled for this over and over. How do we, how do we try to correlate things? So I said, well, what do we correlate? Well, anything we have in GIS, we can correlate it with. Census population, how much transportation is in there, how much impervious cover, land use, whether it's single family, multifamily, commercial, you got it. Um, virtually anything we can put uh, in GIS, we can try to correlate it with. And I noticed in the field that most of the stuff I saw was coming from right there in the creek, the backyard, the, the overflowing dumpster. So I thought, I want a small buffer on this because I think all those impacts are, 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 are stronger, or at least the presence is stronger, near the creek. And then other people said, well, you've got this whole watershed and they're all washing off through storm drains and gutters. We need to look at it bigger. So I said, let's do them both. So we got 300 foot buffers and 3,000 foot buffers on clusters of points up and down the creeks. And uh, next slide, please. <sighs> Takeaway number three, there is no statistically significant correlations between anything in trash intensity. Land use didn't matter, census didn't matter, transportation, parks, all the layers we had, we threw everything at this and none of the spaghetti stuck to the walls, it all fell off. Uh, these are some of these more of these graphs, these messy graphs who have slight trend lines maybe, but if you look at the R squared or the P values, they're just not statistically significant correlations. So we can't assert them as, as being real correlations. There's a, so uh, the takeaway here is, it's not any one person, it's any, any one type, it's not any one group, it's not any one place, it's all of us. It is a community problem, this is a community created problem, and it's gonna have to be a community created solution as well. Next slide, please. So um, virtually anything, <laughs> anything in this city, anything you've bought, anything you've seen, anything you've heard of, anything you've seen on the internet, anything you can buy, sell, or trade in this city is in our creeks lawn mowers to couches, obviously, but then the little things, I just, I found everything in the creeks. Um, it blew my mind. But the, the, the point here is not to, to, to go on about that because it's offices, it's homes, it's uh, traffic cones from, from, from uh, transportation things, it's old infrastructure, it's people doing remodels, it's landscaping. It is literally everything. Uh, the one thing that we saw the most often, and we saw it everywhere and always, is single-use plastics, bottles, styrofoam, styrenes, you get the picture. Um, the whole world is starting to realize how horrible these things is, not just because of microplastics and, and PFOS and other things, but they're just so ubiquitous and they're just so everywhere and we use them once and they're gone out of our hands. Um, the EU, I know, is, is going to not using single-use utensils and other things. We all have to be heading this direction. So the solutions here I'm trying to go with is not just uh, the cleanup or the policy, but it's also we should stop, start resisting uh, taking all of this stuff in. Next slide, please. This was definitely my favorite little nugget. If I had one nugget that a, a reporter could report on, it's this one. Um, and that is that uh, if you look at the highest intensity points, all the, the, the really hor it, it takes several different dumpsters to throw all this stuff away in a 30 foot section. Um, if you look at those areas, they create 76% of all the trash. And this is in our 110 miles. I'm assuming it's the same as the other 90 miles. So 70%, 76% of all the trash is found just in those little hotspots. And those little hotspots comprise 10% of the area. So out of 110 miles, I can say that 76% of all that garbage is in about a mile's worth of creek. So that helps me realize that these areas are getting caught up or they're extreme. There's, they're, they're getting accumulating more and more. That's a good place for us to take them out because a big storm might then act as a propagule and push that down later. Next slide, please. So the bottom line of the field report portion was that uh, we have lots of recommendations in the report, too many of them to d discuss right now, and they go all the way from very, very s tiny little site-specific places like, hey, we've got a problem here, we should actually go here, to the many hot spots, to uh, suggestions for structural controls and, and other ways of, of dealing with trash, and all the way up to like policy and education, and then maybe even kind of this global community, how do we solve this thing? I'm gonna pivot now to Layla's report. Next slide, please. So this kind of went hand in hand. While we were doing the field work, Layla was doing the research. And we quickly found that you kind of group these strategies of how to deal with trash and creeks in the three categories. One is how to actually pull it out once it's there. It's, uh, it's manual physical labor, it's structural controls, it's using these opportunities that we have, these uh, vegetation strainers. Um, but that's difficult, it's expensive, it's hazardous, it's gross. Uh, the next easiest solution is interception. So let's, it's, we know it's gonna be on our landscape, we know there's dumpsters, there's receptacles, let's keep it from washing to our creeks. 
And there's uh, obviously that's kind of like the the ways you can pull strings with uh, the people who. Uh, create the trash, sell the trash, throw the trash away, so everything that's happening on the landscape. And then the last category is source reduction. So this, how, what's, how do we keep this stuff from coming into our community in the first place? Next slide, please. Uh, so extraction. Um, this is probably the most expensive of all the options. Uh, Travis County found that it's five times more expensive to actually pull it out of the creek than it is to prevent it from getting there. Um, we do this all the time. Our, our, our wonderful partners like KAB and TOOF, the other ones foundation, and of course our own staff, Field Ops, is, is out there doing this uh, to keep open waterways flowing. And ARR has a, a team now that came online this last winter of 12 people that do, to pull trash out of creeks. And then there's just volunteer groups all over the place. I mean, there is a, a, a large group of people in this community who have big hearts and, and, and are dedicated to this. But it's expensive, and you can only deal with it so, so, so much. Um, if you look at this slide, you'll notice there's a boom here, and then there's a little uh, uh, kind of catching device. Uh, what you'll notice in that boom is a lot of trash, but if you look closely, it's mostly organics. It's leaves, it's sticks, it's branches, it's, it's stuff like that. So you would have to pull all this stuff apart, and this is part of the problem that uh, Field Ops has a very difficult time is going through this and pulling out just the trash. Uh, so these booms will catch just about everything, mm -hmm. And uh, if you use them in a small area, like a small creek, you might have localized flooding. So there's a very uh, discreet scenario where these do work. We do use them on, on Ladybird. Um, so there's lots of novel devices out there. There's cool little robots for extraction. We'll talk about some of those here in a minute. Next slide, please. Um, there are some really neat things going on in other cities. Um, some of them are, are not, just, not just in our country, but around the world. There's kind of, uh, it's kind of a two-prong. It's kind of part education. It's part awareness. It's part just getting people to understand the problem and just kind of be visible and incentivize uh, people to do this. Um, some Chicago will give you, uh, let you rent free kayaks if you're gonna have a commitment to help clean these up. Um, the trash fishing is kind of cute. They all look like they're having a fun time. I don't know, you know exactly how effective, how much trash they're gonna remove, but I would think that there's a ripple effect there of not just people seeing other people clean up trash and realize that, uh, you know, not to be so apathetic, but those people then might also take that with them the rest of their lives. So uh, it's just experience. Next slide, please. Um, more interception. It's, it has all to do with capacity and access. Um, both Walt Disney and KAB, keep America beautiful, I think, did, they, did their independent study on how far would, a per, would you have to put a trash can before people would stop using it? You know, if you have a trash can right next to you, you're more apt to throw it away. Well, if it's across the room, would you actually walk across the room? Or, or, you know, or, 30 feet. 30 feet is what Walt Disney and KAB independently found is about the furthest someone's going to go to use a trash can. And that's infuriating to me. But that's the reality we live in. Um, the other thing is overflowing dumpsters. You might have a dumpster that services more people than it can possibly handle. So I think um, revisiting uh, the, the policies and rules against uh, ordinances, we're working with uh, depart other departments on that right now. Shopping carts. We found 500 plus shopping carts in our 110 miles. Um, it, it, it astounded me. Now, once a shopping cart gets in a creek, as you might imagine, it's there for a very long time. So these shopping carts have been building up since they've introduced shopping carts. I think we found one of the first shopping carts ever made in, in one of the creeks, Williamson Creek. Um, so how do you keep those shopping carts from, from finding themselves off-site for whatever reason they get off-site? There are places that have, had, that have had this solution a long time ago. If you go to Philadelphia, you'll see some of the shopping carts there, you can't even take them out in the parking lot. There's, there's bollards at the store, and you can't even you can take, it, take your bags to your car. Uh, some of them use tokens. You, in, you have to put a token, and then you can use one. You want your token back. Um, there's other ones have little locking brakes. So if you get it off site, the brakes will lock up. So I think there are solutions. Of course, shopping uh, retail is losing money on this too. It would help them out. Um, we might even be able to figure out some way to get that retailer, if we know it's theirs if, uh, in the creek, but due to the label on it, we might get them to go get it because it's their property, similar to the scooters. Uh, telecommunication, telecommunications cables, this is one that I, I didn't think I would see, but we saw miles and miles and miles and miles of cable. When your cable service provider comes and you change cable from one to the next, they get up there, they hook up your new ones, they cut the line and the line falls. It's not their property, so they're not even allowed to get rid of it. But is your old cable company going to come back and, and get the cable out of the creek? It just falls there. Usually if it's in someone's yard, someone will throw it in the trash. But there's miles and miles and miles of this cable just in the creek just due to the proximity of a lot of residential houses near creeks. Um, next slide, please. 
So to intercept it, to stop it, um, of course, I said that capacity is a problem, proximity is a problem, and accessibility is a problem, too. Um, on, on Ladybird, you'll have these flotillas of hundreds and hundreds of stand-up cattle boards and, and kayaks and stuff, and they're all having a great time, but where does their trash go? There's no trash can, certainly not within 30 feet. So some uh, communities have got like a little boat. You can throw it in a little boat. Um, me having mesh bags attached to all of these things just to give them a place to put this, because they're not thinking about it. They're going to go rent a, rent a kayak and have a good time. But you're having a mesh bag there. Um, there's lots of opportunities because there are vendors that are partners to the city that we could have some kind of influence on. Um, right, uh, we, we saw a lot of picnic tables that people love to be outside, and I encourage people to get outside just, just because that gives them a vestment in the nature. But if you have a picnic table right next to a, a creek or something like that and no trash can, that presents a problem. Um, so, and we can look at, uh, we can rethink about uh, how effective is street sweeping strategically in its places. Um, inlet drains, some people talk about cost. How much does it cost to do all this? Well, a single inlet drain cover, if you have a good way to clean it, it's not going to cause flooding fit plugs, isn't that much. But we've got thousands and thousands of inlet drains. So, if you, how do you scale that cost? Uh, that what's your bank, what's your best bank for your buck? Next slide, please. Um, source reduction is ultimately the cheapest way to keep it out of our creeks. If we're not getting styrofoams in our town, if we're getting less single-use bottles in our town, if we're getting these things less here, we don't even have to worry about it. Um, people can start, uh, and they're going to have to at some point. There's going to be a paradigm shift, and America's going to be the last one to do it. Texas will probably be the last one out of all of America to do it. But we're going to have to start reducing our dependence on a lot of that single-use pack uh, products and packaging. Um, I, it, I've never, th I, I can't believe I haven't thought of some of these things. When you go to a, a restaurant and you have your leftovers, bring a Ziploc bag or a Tupperware with you, right? Well, you need their, their styrofoam container. If they have a styrofoam camera, you put your, fit, your hand out and say no. I mean, there's, there's a whole lot of strategy out there that we just need to start to incorporate into our mind, and that's where it goes to the kind of education component to get people to help us with that source reduction to put your hands out and say no thanks. Uh, next slide, please. Am I almost done here? Yeah. Okay, so here's the take-homes. Here's the elevator speech. The bottom line is, Trash and Creeks is all of us. There's no one in the city that's not partially to blame. Not that everyone's in the city is throwing it on the ground, but we're all part of that single use, that, that fuel, that waste stream that's moving through. There's no one source you can point it at, and blaming it on, on, on one particular group of people is, is folly. If I were to solve homelessness tomorrow and everybody had homes and everybody was happy, you would still have this problem. And so we, we cannot uh, waste our time on trying to play the blame game. COA and partners are actively engaged in the solution. Uh, and there's room for improvement and innovation still, but I got to tell you, um, in my 18 years of, do, of being in the creeks, this was probably one of my low points of, of what, what I feel is the state of our environment. Absolutely one of the low points. The other one was a wastewater spill where I, I had to sample what living things were still alive in wastewater, and that was not awesome. But what I also found was an, an incredibly amount, a, a large amount of admiration and um, appreciation for my departments and the people in my departments. Whenever uh, Layla would find a, a good idea, like, hey, there's, we've got Adopt a Creek, what about adopt a drain? Some some communities doing adopt a drain. If you you've got you know you don't have to commit to a whole creek, just adopt this one stormwater drain. And education department already thought about it. They're already implementing the program. There is adopt a drain. It's happening. It's it's available. Uh, they're they're starting to starting slow and they're ramping it up. So like all these ideas that we came up that, that we found that, that were innovative and interesting and new, someone had either already thought about it or they're already doing it or they tried it and it didn't work. So I really feel like this the COA has been quietly trying all, all these things. Uh, COA is working on improving efficiency and effectiveness of programs to extract, intercept, and reduce. So we are kind of working on all these uh, aspects. Um, we're hoping that this report uh, will help us uh, be a little more strategic in uh, our locations of how we clean up, what we clean up, help our partners be a little more strategic, and then use some of these recommendations and start testing new things. I think there's opportunities for our Water control, uh, water quality controls, our detention and water quality ponds, to help trap some of these things. Because uh, in a large storm event, water goes in, water goes out. The floatables do too. Well, we don't want to cause any flooding, but we might be able to somehow arrest or harness or grab some of that trash still in those controls. And then the people who own that 
control would be responsible to remove it. So I, I think there's a lot of recommendations and a, and a lot of option, uh, opportunities here. We're just kind of working through this toolbox and seeing which one works for Austin and which one doesn't work for Austin. Uh, and just to give you an example of a recent one, uh, there's a little cool little uh, robot called a jelly bot fish. And it's this little uh, motorized vehicle that goes in the water and it goes around and it scoops uh, trash out of the water. Brilliant. Um, we had the guy from, uh, the, the company came from France to show it to us and uh, we wouldn't even put it in Ladybird. And he said, it's because you've got too much uh, vegetation. You've got too much, I don't want to trap your wildlife. It works great for maybe ocean marinas or something like that, but not so much for our environment. Um, there's a potential small use for it in other places, but um, there are options out there and we're looking at them, we're testing them, we're trying them. It's just going to take a while to get through them all. With that, uh, next slide please. I would love to uh, give lots of appreciation, not just to the people that are here that are, were instrumental in, in completing this, but also the people beside this, behind the scenes who helped with the report, who helped uh, do the project management, who helped uh, do the actual field work, and then manage all the data. It's, it's, it's an inordinate amount of data to, to deal with. And then the GIS people and the statisticians and the math people, uh, we have we're kind of like this one-stop shop for smart people in my group. And then, of course, all our partners. And there are more partners here, and I sincerely apologize to, to uh, groups or people uh, that I have left out. Uh, of course, ARR has a great clean cleanup crew. PARD does a lot of cleanup. Parks are just kind of that tragedy of the commons area where they're constantly paying to remove people's trash. Um, field ops, of course, uh, they are constantly in, in the creeks and, and kind of on the front lines of clogging creeks with trash, uh, of unclogging creeks with trash. Keep Austin Beautiful, uh, certainly. Uh, Other Ones Foundation, uh, APF. And then uh, lots of the contractors and the volunteers that do the dirty work uh, kind of for us. So with that, next slide. I'll be happy to entertain any questions. Um, I would direct, the, I'm going to punt to the experts, though, if you have a question um, for the, the people that are here. No, thank you very much. Uh, it was uh, very informative. We've been actually wanting, wanting to hear this presentation for a long time, so uh, thank you. Um, does anyone remote have any questions for, for these guys? Yeah, Scott, go for it. A uh, great report. I really appreciate it. Um, it's very, very uh, well done, uh, comprehensive, uh, understandable, well delivered. Um, uh, great job. Um, you know, um, it's, a, it's an issue I've been kind of interested in um, since the 70s. Um, uh, I, I was, uh, I, I, I was an editor on Environmental Action Magazine, and uh, even back in the 70s, it was an issue that was uh, being looked at, discussed, and uh, and uh, there was. Uh, a fair amount of uh, concern um, uh, being paid to it. Um, I spent a little time in, in Mexico, and, you know, uh, you just don't see that single-use problem in Mexico. People uh, go to the Mercado with a, a hand-woven plastic basket. They, they, they go shopping. They pick up their, uh, their uh, vegetables and their uh, pollo, uh, whatever it is they're going to eat, and uh, they take it home in their basket and they uh, they eat it, and that's um, that's it. I mean, there's nothing to throw away except maybe the bones uh, from the chicken, and uh, so you just you just don't see um, the you know we we have a a, a throwaway society, and um, the sol the solution, as you know, is going to be. Uh, moving from a throwaway society to a, a, a society in which, which we reuse things. And I know that there are um, there are organizations that want to do that. I, uh, NPR had a story on on uh, vineyards that were trying to uh, to recapture their their uh, 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 bottles because it's, it's expensive to make um, uh, glass bottles it takes a lot of energy to make them, and I was just thinking about what we have in Austin. We have um, we have a central central market um, uh, produces a, an upscale. Um, uh, uh, it's now four dollar uh, 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 soft drinks that that 
Yes, an expensive uh, bottle, and I, I would think they'd want to recapture them, just like we used to to uh, to recycle uh, Coca-Cola bottles until we went to metal. Uh, aluminum is extremely uh, uh, expensive to uh, to manufacture. I don't know if, uh, how many of you have ever seen a, a, an aluminum reduction works, but. Uh, it takes a tremendous amount of electricity to uh, refine aluminum. And so the, the, the more aluminum that we can recycle and, and reuse, uh, the better. I think aluminum is fine, but uh, I think uh, reusing, uh, if, we can, if we can get people, uh, in, and this will take probably uh, uh, companies that are interested in doing it. Starbucks, for example, they, you know, they have all these uh, coffee uh, containers that that, uh, that are glass and they're well made they're strong you know you can throw them and they they don't break uh, and those kinds of, of glass i think we can be recycling i think we can do a, a a tremendous amount more and i understand we're a little bit um hobbled at the moment by the state um saying okay well you can't do anything about uh, uh single use uh plastics but i do think we can discourage them you know, I don't think we have to use them. I think we could, we could at least uh, have a have a public information uh, campaign in which we encourage people to find other ways to uh, to use water and to uh, to use large water bottles instead of single use water bottles, for example. Uh, so uh, I just those are just a few comments and things that I have thought about since I read your report, and because uh, because that single use. Uh, uh, plastic container seems to be our, our biggest problem that, that we can that we that if we can address that I think uh, we, we solve uh, I don't know how what percentage 50 percent uh, maybe of our, of our problem uh, a, a significant amount and, and I don't see why we shouldn't be uh, at least trying to find ways that we can address it um, so again I want to just thank you very much I, if you, I don't know if, if anything I said uh, is something you want to comment on, but uh, I, I really appreciate you bringing this to us. I think it's a it's a really important topic and really something that we need to uh, come up with some solutions uh, through in the uh, environmental commission to address. Absolutely, no, I, I wholeheartedly agree with what you've said. Uh, I would want to give uh, uh, props to Austin Water, who has been uh, adding uh, watering stations. You know, if, if for your uh, to put more water in a bottle or something like that. There, those are increasing, and that's going to enable people. So there's something the city does need to do to help people transition in, in that respect. And uh, Thank you. also, so the bag ban. You guys remember when the bag ban came around? Um, uh, HEB was a really wonderful partner because they kind of kept up with uh, that, even though after the legislature uh, let us know that we, we couldn't regulate containers. They're having the same problem in other states, obviously, uh, in Florida. Um, in Florida, they wanted to regulate styrofoam, but they kind of have that same impediment uh, legislation that they, they couldn't do that. But they've decided to approach it from a different angle, and that is from a toxicity standpoint. And they, they're gaining some traction on that, that if they choose to uh, if to regulate something as a toxin, and that could be microplastics, PFOS, uh, stuff like that, if you can regulate it as a, as a uh, toxin, then you're going to have a lot more uh, ability to regulate something than if you were to regulate it as a container. So there's, there's are different approaches out there that people are trying. Anybody else remote have comments? Yeah, Qureshi, go for it. Yeah, just wanted to first of all, you know, thank you all for the presentation. Uh, definitely seems like a lot of work. Uh, so super cool. You know, I know personally, people in my neighborhood uh, have been was that concerned with this issue for a while, right? Um, yeah, you know, I guess with the you know trash in the in the creeks and you know, in the waterways and whatnot, you know, uh, when you brought up sort of like. Uh, you know, the pictures of, you know, people in other places, right, that have sort of these these volunteer sort of, uh, you know, pickup efforts. It kind of reminded me of, like, you know, the recent pictures you see of, like, the flotillas of people paddle boating mm -hmm. in the Colorado River, right, and it just looks like a giant mass. And it's just like, okay, if all these tech company people are moving here, right, for the environment to be, you know, uh, as pristine as allowing people to paddle boat in it, right, if they could apply that same sort of uh, 
recreational vigor to helping clean up our waterways and creeks, right? I think that would be super cool. Obviously, you know, university students are always looking for volunteer stuff to put on their resume. So this could be a great opportunity to partner with, you know, local uh, you know, educational institutions uh, to provide, you know, some kind of experience and just help them, you know, get acclimated to taking ownership, uh, you know, of the the city that they live in, you know. Um, and then I guess, you know, also when you talked about, um, you know, uh, like you know, restaurants uh, cutting down on waste, you know, grocers cutting down on waste, you know, it can't, it kind of came to mind that, you know, we have sort of these, uh, certific these environmental certifications for buildings, right? Like, you know, lead green or gold or whatever. Uh, what if we came up with some kind of similar rating system for like, you know, um, a restaurant or, you know, a grocer or something like that, uh, you know, where it could be sort of like a selling point, right? Everybody's talking about sustainable, right? Uh, what is it? Farm to table, right? But I think, you know, having some kind of way that they could stamp uh, something on their business that show that, you know, they were really, um, you know, sort of invested in, you know, responsible environmental stewardship all the way around, I think would be a win for everybody. Um, and yeah, lastly, uh, you know, it was cool to see the other ones foundation on there. I have a lot of friends that work for them. They do really cool work. Uh, I remember there was, uh, a gentleman who came uh, and spoke publicly, I think a few sessions ago, and they had an organization called, I think, Springdale Park Friends, something like that. Um, and so they basically work with people that are Springdale Park neighbors, that's what it is. Uh, so they basically work with, you know, um, unhoused citizens to provide opportunities for them. And a lot of their uh, opportunities come from like cleaning up the park, specifically Givens, right? So if we had a situation like that, I think it would be a win because if we can get people out of encampments, right, ideally that helps clear up some of the trash issue. Certainly, I think from an optics perspective of how people view these homeless uh, encampments, right, um, I think if you solve the problem holistically instead of just focusing on, okay, yeah, we got rid of the trash this one time, right, but unless we can help people get off the creeks, right, they're going to continue to do that. Same thing with shopping cart thing, right? I mean people are going to need shopping carts, especially if you're, you know, unhoused to keep stuff in, right? So it's like, okay, like there's a reason that people are taking shopping carts out of these shopping plazas for the most part, right? Unless it's just like, you know, some someone for laughs throwing it in the creek, which I guess that's uh, mental health issues there, right? So uh, yeah, those are just a few of my thoughts, yeah. No, those are excellent. And actually underscores a point that, uh, that I recall, uh, one of the things we need to do really is to coordinate across departments of, and with the uh, volunteer organizations so that we can't just kind of like haphazardly and randomly do as, as many things as we can, but maybe do it in more a, a concert um, to try to get uh, all, all parts of the, the city clean as well. And I love your idea about the rating system, kind of like a leads for uh, just environmentally friendliest for, for I, I love that idea. I think that's good. I'll, 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 uh, I'll bring that one back and pitch it. Yeah, for sure. And I think my last point, right, is like how you said, like, this was definitely one of your low points, but to also remind us that it's really only going to get worse, right? Like, the more people move here, while we would like to do more and more, right, does the rate of how we clean up match the rate of people moving here, right? So I think work's cut out, right? The work is cut out. So, but yeah, appreciate the presentation for sure. And, you know, shout out everybody involved. Anybody else remote? Bristol. I know I'm kind of jumping out of turn here, but um, uh, first off, love the presentation. Um, you, you and I are, are um, of a, a similar um, species that enjoys walking down uh, creeks mm -hmm. um, and, and, and looking at things. Um, uh, I, I, you know, um, I mean, obviously, the the legislation that was passed, um, the Texas level, um, you know, saying that um, cities cannot uh, have local rules uh, around um, plastic bags, uh, to me, was a real black eye in the um, concept that cities should be able to set their own standards. Um, and I would love to see that uh, reinstated or reviewed or revisited. Um, but that's something that we have to do. 
uh, at the upper level. Um, and, um, and, but I love it that y'all are keeping a real eye on what are other states doing um, to look and see how they're addressing it and how maybe we can, how we can dance around that, um, you know, and, and bring that back because it, it was, it was so easy. I mean, people just started taking their own bags and I never heard, I never heard anybody complain. I mean, you know, it's like, Oh, I forgot my bag. That's about all I ever heard. Um, and, and as someone who rides horses, there is nothing more terrifying to a horse than a plastic bag blowing around. I'm just saying. Um, so I, I really um, uh, enjoy that. I, I, and I, you know, I honestly, I completely love your statement that it's no one contributor. It's all of us. It's every single one of us. We can't point the finger of blame. We have to all take action and we all have to be in this together. And, you know, thinking about big picture, I mean, I'd love to see more, um, more marketing campaign around this very, you know, strategic, um, around, around those things. And, and it sounds like you're already thinking about some of the educational components, um, around that as well. So I just want to say, you know, thank you so much for your doing, um, 500 shopping carts. That's an impressive number. Um, wow. Yeah. Um, I'm sure that Target and Walmart and HEB and everybody else uh, would um, would like to know those numbers and and you know put a put a price tag on that um, somehow and and say you know let them really start brainstorming and let let the companies decide how they want to uh, address that and and really get their buy-in on it. So anyway, thank you so much. Really, really, it, this was dessert. This was dessert. <laughs> Thompson, yes. You never find unmute. Thank you very much. Um, even though it was last, it was not least. I really appreciate your presentation and your energetic approach to a somewhat dismal circumstance and the alleviation of it for the rest of us because um, we were really looking forward to this. So the one thing that I would like to consider is perhaps water quality at different um, at at these different sites as well. I'm not sure if that's uh, something that could be added to your grid, but I think that there are people that do water quality. If you guys could get on the same page there. Yeah, um, and so I am in charge of the EII, the Environmental Integrity Index, and that's the baseline monitoring where we walk, do uh, monitor all the creeks in Austin, and that's going through a, an evolution now, too, to become more technologically sophisticated with modeling approaches. But uh, what I can tell you, and I'll be the first to admit, uh, our group who does that monitoring for years and years uh, literally uh, and figuratively turned a blind eye to the trash and creeks problem because uh, we always felt that this was an aesthetics issue and this is an issue of, of trash, not necessarily water quality. We are focused on things like E. coli, sewage, nutrients, PAHs. I mean, there's, there's no shortage of pollutants to look at when you're talking about water and, and sediment, pesticides, herbicides, I, I go on. But uh, we always thought, you know, a plastic bottle is not a water quality issue. And I think that uh, with the uh, advances in technology that we found with, with uh, these emerging contaminants, we're starting to realize that the amounts are becoming to be a significant issue, and it is a water quality problem. Uh, the trick there about monitoring a site for its impacts in water quality is there are a million things that you could monitor for. You know, is it, is it a battery or, you know, so picking your, uh, picking your pollutant of choice to test for, you, you, can only, you can only test for it if you know what you're looking for. That would be uh, horrendously expensive to try to tweeze that out. So I think uh, the priority should be keeping it from getting in the trash in the first place and having good partners like ATD to come up with the, uh, and working with 311 to get the things like scooters that have lithium batteries out of the creeks. So uh, yeah, no water quality is a concern. And I think it's, it, we've finally kind of come around to that, uh, that understanding now. A little too late maybe. Anybody else remote? All right, anybody, uh, anybody uh, at home uh, comments? Brimer, go for it. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, this is very interesting. You packed a lot of information in a very short period of time. Uh, got a couple of questions. Uh, the Parks Department uh, 
quit putting trash cans in the parks and at some time in the past few years. And their concept was uh, something called pack in, pack out. The idea is they wanted to uh, not have to pick up the trash. Is that, have you noticed, I mean, I don't know how your, when your study was done and et cetera, et cetera, but I always thought that was kind of a silly thing because people aren't going to pack the trash out if they're. So, so are you, because there certainly are trash cans oh. along the trails. If, if you don't mind, uh, if you could turn the mic on so the other okay. commissioners could hear. And identify yourself too. Uh, Layla Gosling with Watershed. Um, I did talk to a lot of parks people. There are parks, you know, like Zilker Park obviously has trash cans in the picnic right. areas. There's a lot of trash cans on the trails. Um, frequently they're overfilled. They have tested solar compacting trash bins in some places. Um, part of the problem is the frequency they can visit the more remote. And they have kind of moved towards uh, the Leave No Trace, which is kind of a national park right. for people who are more hiking and um, moving farther out. But there certainly are less trash cans out along those more remote trails. But there are a lot of trash cans. That part spends a lot of time emptying trash cans. I ask because in part of the town where I live, mm -hmm. uh, they've studiously removed the trash cans. Uh, for example, uh, you know, Bull Creek District Park and some other places, really? they don't make a big effort to, uh, you know, put trash cans out there, St. Edwards Park. So anyway, and I don't mean to call out anyone in particular, I'm just asking if this has contributed to the parks and, you know, trash in the parks. And that may not be an answerable question. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned had to do with uh, the source of the trash being uh, dumpsters that didn't, and I forget the term you used, you know, there was a dumpster and it was overflowed and there was some sort of a secondary protection. What was that term? That I, I, that is not a term that's necessarily used. It's secondary containment. So any anytime you, you try to contain something in a container, you might have spillover. So you might want to have a second barrier. That could be a small wall. It could be just as easy as a chain link fence. Anything to keep anything from wind blowing it out or stuff that stacks on the side to, from continuing on down gradient or, or blown by wind. Right. Is there any uh, city code or land development or blah, 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 blah that uh, uh, kind of addresses trash? I have made that comment uh, just recently. Uh, ARR is, is working on their Herculean effort to revise their comprehensive plan. And so they're working with us and they're, we're, we're talking and engaged with them. Uh, I don't know that answer. I have that, I've had that same question myself and I want to look into that. I think that's a low hanging plum, really. I only ask that because we're uh, talking about this thing called land development code tonight and uh, environmental things uh, that address this type of thing for the environment and this might be an opportunity to grab the low hanging fruit and uh, you know do something with it so that's the only reason why I asked uh, Liz Johnston with the watershed protection uh, there might be something in title six related to uh, illegal discharges and, and mm -hmm. trash, um, we can look through there. I don't think it's in the land development code per se. The land development code may dictate location and necessarily, but not prohibit littering, which would be in a different section of the code, but we could, we could find out where that is. Well, uh, but containment, you know, you can say, well, if you're gonna build this big a building, True. then you need this big a thing. And oh, by the way, you need to have a fence around it, not so much for the visual impact of having a trash bin around your $50 billion building, but because it blows everywhere and becomes a nuisance to everyone on the planet. So that could be part of other stuff. Um, have you... Does anyone ever note, I mean, when you went around and found these these trash bins that are overflowing and blowing around, does, is there any effort to notify the owners of the property where these are located that by saying, hey, you know, you need a bigger trash bin or you need more frequent pickups or 
There were some instances where I made that call to like the, the spills team who coordinated with the owner to, to work on that. Um, I didn't know the correct avenue to approach that. And like I said, it's, this is the, the, the next low hanging plum on my, on my list is to start digging into that more deeply. Because I, I don't know that anybody knows, but maybe uh, if 311 app could, uh, we, could, we could have the right uh, end department that would be able to notify or talk to or work with uh, an owner or something like that. Um, I don't think that uh, it, that is in place at this time, but uh, it's definitely something that's on our list of things to do. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you very much. You did a great job. Thank you. Well, I picked the wrong day to bring this. <laughs> <laughs> So, but what it, the reason I have this actually is because at home I have two and a half cases of single bottled water, you know, and it's because of the water treatment issues we had. Mm -hmm. And you're, you have to prepare for an emergency, and of course then the water expires, so you have to use it within a certain time frame. I also recall when there was an opportunity for us to get water, uh, if for those that needed water, they were asking us bring large containers so we can fill them and my neighbors none of us had large containers so we're like right. what do we do all we had was what was at the store which which was so i don't know if there's a way to maybe work with the there's the resiliency hub opportunity that working on um, in regards to emergency response but if there's maybe containers that could be offered for us to maybe buy or use. I'm thinking my next strategy, instead of thinking ahead, is getting either the two gallon water, because that's less plastic, but have mm -hmm. that as an emergency. But I think there's a, there should be a way for us to deal with, I hate it having to buy those cases of water, um, but that's the only options we had. So I don't know if there's any, any way to mitigate and reduce that kind of waste. That came up a couple times when and we have large emergencies and disasters, and then you have trucks and trucks full of single bottles and they're handed out. And how do we close that loop? You know, they're out there now. How do we get them back? That came up. And, and obviously, health and human safety is penultimate. So that's the first concern. But trying to be cognizant of that, maybe plan ahead, is I haven't heard any good solutions yet um, uh, of, of how to do something. But uh, obviously, once you give a single use, uh, container, you don't have to just use it one time, you could use it over and over. So then uh, having more watering stations uh, available in more, more areas that they could uh, reuse that same container, if that's uh, an advised thing. I'm not sure, sometimes they say don't use this bottle more than once for health reasons, but yeah. um, no, that's, that is distribution is, is a big problem. Okay, thank you. I really appreciate y'all's presentation. So, but I just, again, thought, oh gosh, we should hide this now, but it's too late. <laughs> just <laughs> thank you. Just for your information, the, um, there are some treatment devices that people take like when they're hiking, not for large volumes of water, but to have in your house so that water doesn't expire. Was, I think one's called the life straw, and, but they literally, you can just flow water through it and it will treat it to drinkable, you know, remove all Yeah, there's some ultraviolet light yeah, ones yeah. too, yeah. It's a great point. All right, anybody else? Yes, um, Melinda Shira, and I just wanted to thank you for your work. Um, I, I personally have cleaned in the creeks and, and our streets, and so I have a few questions. I'm wondering if you guys looked at any correlation of um, litter on streets and then um, there being a correlation to litter in the creeks as well. We did. Um, so yeah, if you drive down the highway, there's litter and there's like no other source except for the out of the back of a pickup truck or just people chunking out of the window. So proximity to uh, transportation was absolutely at the top of our list and it didn't correlate either. It was in there. What we did was we took impervious cover and then we took uh, two different types of transportation layers. Uh, a lot of these things we looked at many different ways and uh, transportation didn't correlate either. You would think it is. You'd think it does, but it, it does not. I was, I was blown away that, that uh, population didn't correlate well. And wow. I, I think the, the main reason is, it, there may very well be that transportation is a source. And these different things are all sources. But the way they manifest themselves moving through the creeks doesn't lend itself to uh, seeing that correlation 
so that the trash will all get bundled up somewhere by a culvert or by something. So there's no way, unless I had GPS tagged every single piece of trash, I would know where it came from. So there may very well be those correlations. I'm certain there are. They just, we can't tweeze them out uh, the, the way that you would classically with science. And um, so I like the question about trash and its, its actual effect on the mm -hmm. environment. And I'm wondering if you, if you have anything to add to that. Like, what is the actual effect on the environment? It's a fine question. And I, I think one of these, like, emerging, the emerging contaminants, you read more about these things and you realize how truly horrible some of these things are, the PFAS and the PFOAS and stuff like that. Um, I, I, for one, never made the connection, it, although my whole career has been with water quality. And I'm out in the creeks and realizing, realizing uh, a cushion or something like that as it decays. If you step on it, it's just this plume of vibrant colors come out in the water. And um, it's, it's, it's been a revelation to me of a pivot point, really, where I need to be focusing more on. And I, I think that, um, I think it's one of these things that uh, it's kind of not new, but we're learning a lot more now with the technology. So um, I'm fascinated with myself, and we've got a long way to go to learn. <laughs> I have personally, um spent during one cleanup trying to dig a shopping cart out <laughs> yes. of the creek bed. Um, yes. And so, you know, I, I definitely want to, um, I, you know, definitely appreciate any help preventing shopping carts from getting into creeks when I see a shopping cart. I do, um, or my husband has an F-150, so I will try, you know, sometimes and return it to where it goes. Um, but I do appreciate the efforts um, of preventing those from getting into the creeks, especially, but just from off of the property itself. Um, as far as property management goes, I am wondering, when you see a property that habitually has mm -hmm. um, dumping, maybe, or um, the trash nearby and, and on the property itself, um, you can tell it's obviously overflow from the, from the dumpster. Um, what, what is the process there as far as addressing, addressing that problem? So that, that kind of manifests itself in different ways. And what I would suggest is any kind of uh, observation or complaint like that should always go to 311. The nice thing about 301 is that they can then track different types of calls and associate with that point so they can determine whether or not there's a, a repeat offender or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know the, the, that the pathways are thought out well enough in 311 of who to direct those to, but 311 is, is a, a marvelous uh, tool that we could use to, to try to identify and track those. I, I think that the second part of that is also identifying how large of the container needs to be required for certain properties, maybe mm. based on the occupancy or density. And, and so I'm a little curious about how that's determined. I don't know that as well. And I think that's probably a better ARR question. I don't know if they, if they are, in, uh, are vested with those rules or, or what those rules are. Um, there's certainly, there are out there, but I don't know those. But that's an inquiry I'd like to make to um, probably ARR. Okay. I saw that you are recommending dump days. Is that something that's already being planned? I really like the idea, so I just want to hear a little bit more about the dump days. Um, it was one of the recommendations. Actually, Travis County paid for a um, study on illegal dumping and came up with a number like it's five times more expensive to clean up than, than it is to prevent it. And one of their, um, and Texas State actually did that study, um, one of their recommendations was actually anything that eases it, um, free dump days being one of those. We haven't actually implemented that. I don't, we might have some, we I think, we think we have some special dumps. I just at my house got um, a thing where they will now come to my house and pick up hazardous waste. They have so, um, mm. like you can call and have it scheduled rather than bringing it to has um, waste, but it's not, in operation yet, but I'm sure that Travis County is um, pursuing it, and hopefully may, we will too, because just the cost of cleaning up is so much more than it is to provide a place. Um, in New Orleans, they were in the port areas, they were having such a problem that they just literally put dumpsters in those areas, and then they paid a contractor to come and pick them, replace them, and empty them, and it was so much cheaper than having to go back and clean up the mess afterwards. 
while I'm on here, I, I wanted to say one of the things that I found out that I didn't know was that there are litter rules for the city. Um, you're required, every property owner, so you can report this to 311, to pick up any litter on your property to the middle of the adjacent street within 24 hours of it being <laughs> deposited there. I didn't know that, and it can be fined up to $2,000. I think most fines are based probably on dumping, um, and we do pursue those, um, particularly habitual dumpers. Um, we have a whole, some people dedicated to repeat offenders. But, so definitely use that 311. There is a trash and debris on property, one of the items, but um, I think as long as you give the as much specifics as you can, hopefully it would get to the right place. Yeah, that that's, sounds interesting. I have a property that's um, off of Peyton, Jen, and Lamar, and people throw trash all the time in, on the, to the property, but um, I clean it up, and it's, yeah, that's, maybe I should put a trash can. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they're just, they're walking by and driving by, but yeah, maybe I should put a trash can out there. Every 30 feet, yes. Um, I just wanted to make one more comment about encampments, because I, I do know that it's a problem, and I'm wondering if there are expected to be some sort of rules around encampments. I know it's a, a touchy subject, but I, I'm just wondering, um, you know, they're not going away. Are we going to at least provide some sort of rules around what encampments can look like, entail, um, that sort of thing? Before you answer, I'm going to move that we extend the meeting until 10.05, because we need to do that. But I, I don't want to go too much farther, but I do want to talk about this a little bit. So I, I move we extend the meeting to 10.05, which is another eight minutes. Second. Second. Nicholas got there. All those in favor, raise your hand. All those opposed? I did not see Commissioner Scott's hand, but uh, that bit passes. Okay, so go, go ahead. You, was, you, you, you have sweet few minutes. Almost <laughs> saved by the bell. I can't use those minutes because that, that is, uh, I do know that the city is scrambling with this. Every department is scrambling with this. And I know that, you know, the Violet Bag Program and that there are uh, dumpsters that are placed at places of known encampments. Um, so I, I do know that there is a, a lot of um, attempts to try to get a handle on that. Uh, and just the, 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 the global problem too, right? But uh, I don't know what rules would do to, 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 to resolve that in, in, you know, in the classic sense. So I don't have a good answer for you, and I'm, I'm sorry about that, but it is a complicated problem. I'm going to make a couple comments, and then we're going to move on. But I very much appreciate the presentation, all the hard work. Um, I really do think uh, that like a GIS, a GPS tracker on like one bottle, and you can mm. name him like Joe the bottle and put him in Shoal Creek and then see when he shows up in the Gulf of Mexico or something or if there's an example of another city that's done that I'd be curious just from an educational good. standpoint yeah. um, but a couple thoughts to kind of go off of what Commissioner Brimer was saying if you have any best management practices for developments that that you would like to you know mm. that there's a lot of PUDs that come before us that that you know if we, we would like you to, to pilot a secondary containment idea for your dumpsters because you're in the Barton Springs zone or something. I just, if you've got ideas, um, we, we're, we're, we're open to, to, to hearing them, you know, send us an email or something like that. Um, and then uh, another idea would be um, if there is information about the, how to adopt a storm drain, if y'all could get that to us whenever it does go live so we could send it out to, to our people, that'd be awesome. Um, and then lastly, uh, with the flotillas, are there any best practices from like New Braunfels or other areas that have vendors? You know, we, we have we have kayak. I know not every uh, every flotilla participant is is renting something from a vendor on the sure. but but we those vendors do come before us. So um, if there are conditions or ideas that you have, we'd love to hear those. Well, New Braunfels did the infamous can ban. They ban every single use item, Ziploc bags, everything, and restrict styrofoam containers, which I would really like to see done. Um, 
the San Marcos takes a little different approach, and I think the, the mesh bags is one that um, Buffalo River in Arkansas requires that every watercraft that goes out, including not at, just at vendors. Vendors uh, provide watercraft, and, um, but anybody going on the river can be fined if they don't have one, and they also sell them. Um, for people who aren't launching. Um, San Marcos has a program where they set up tents at all those other launch points, and they provide mesh bags and education and all this other stuff, which I think we could do. I think the mesh bags is a great idea and, and pretty easy and inexpensive to implement. Um, certainly our vendors could have them attached to the watercraft, and we could kind of maybe do the, the tent thing. That's the easiest way to, because you look at those stand-up paddle boards, they don't go out there with a thing to contain their trash. They just don't. And I row on the lake, and now there's a lot of smushed cans on the bottom of the lake where it's gotten so shallow outside Barton. But, um, and it's obviously the lake itself is not a, the only source of all that stuff. It's still going to be coming in from the tributaries. But certainly it would be nice if we, those people going on the water were taking their stuff back off. So, Thank you. Um, and then lastly, maybe this is. To, to email since we're running out of time, but if, if there's uh, any kind of a uh, forecasted educational component, like a pilot program or, or something, it'd be interested to see if, if you piloted an educational component in one area and then went back to some of your data points mm -hmm. in that area and, or did a couple different ones and then tried to see, like this one was the most effective or something, just floating that out there. But we're, we're pretty much done. Any last thoughts? <laughs> I just had um, one thing. Um, one thing that I noticed that, well, that I'd be kind of curious to see is like, um, as we come out of this pandemic, like if that would like address some of the issues of single use um, c containers. Cause like one thing I thought of was like with Starbucks, like they had the reusable cups and stuff like that. And then I remember buying one and then like a month later, no, we're not u taking reusable cups <laughs> <laughs> because we're in COVID. And so I'm kind of curious if that may help with some, like as we come kind of, I don't know, maybe redefine COVID protocols or pandemic protocols, if that would address um, single use plastic issues. And also I agree that it's gonna take all the cities coming together to kind of form a plan to like work through this because I, I just think of like when we had the bag ban in Austin, I had like two friends that they were so stubborn about the bag ban, like they went to Pflugerville because <laughs> Pflugerville, I'm like, you'd rather like waste gas and like pollute the air than pay 25 cents for a bag. But like they were just that stubborn and that's the kind of stuff that we're kind of dealing with. And so I think it's gonna take the cities working together and the nearby cities to be on the same page to kind of address that. And thank you for the presentation. <laughs> yeah, thank you. You're welcome. All right, thank you guys, you're off the hook. Thanks for dessert, very much appreciate it. <laughs> um, in one minute and a couple seconds, do we have